Garth, how was this project presented to you for Lion? I was at Sundance Film Festival uh, with Top of the Lake, actually, and the producers of that, Ian uh, Canning and Emil Sherman, and I were just getting together and uh, they had just read this article about Saru's story, it had just, come, just come out, and they just said, oh my God, this is so you, Garth. You should read it. So I raced up to my lodge and I read the article and totally fell in love with Saru's story. I said, guys, this is fantastic. So they said, okay, well, we'll go and try and get the rights to it. And um, so the next day they started trying to find out who had the rights to his story. And, um, and I think about a month later, Emil had secured the rights to the project and we started getting into it. So had you read his book in the meantime? The book hadn't come out at all. So this was very early on. Um, so it was just a, it was, it, was, it was an article in the press that had come out um, when Sru had just found his mother. So that's all we had read. Um, so when we started, when we got the rights, we started to research the project. His book came out um, somewhere along the line after that. And then at what point are you actually sitting down, meeting Sru, maybe even going to India? So as soon as we got the rights, the first thing I said is I need to go to India um, and start retracing his steps and, and feeling this, feeling his story. And coincidentally at the time, Australian 60 Minutes was doing a, a, an article on Saru and they were taking um, the adoptive mother, Sue, to meet the birth mother, Kamala, for the first time. So I was there when they were filming that and that was my first day in my research trip. So I was suddenly kind of thrust very deeply into this family's uh, life and experience and um, yeah, kind of saw some crazy things. It was amazing. Um, so that was my first day in the research. And then from that point on, I kind of retraced young Saru's journey. I went on some trains. I went to Calcutta, went to the orphanages. Um, I wandered around the streets at night, imagining what it would be like for him to be living on these streets. I mean, I have children myself. Um, so. Uh, the whole that whole ex journey for me was very impactful, um, and then I went to Hobart and met all of his contemporary friends, hung out with John, uh, Saru's father, and um, just tried to immerse myself in in their life as much as possible. And uh, what time frame is that that you're actually kind of sinking in Saru's world? Oh God, uh, look, I, I probably spent. Um, I think the trip was like three weeks, probably, and then. I would continue on with um, conversations and phone calls, Skypes, and then I would revisit some of these places again as well. Okay. And then you somehow presented this idea to Luke, or how did this come Yeah, so mm -hmm. I started the research trip and then the three of us, Amelia and, and myself, we started to look at different writers. And um, we all really loved Luke, and so we engaged with Luke, and at a certain point he became officially engaged with the project. And then we quickly sent him on the same trip I did. Right. So at least we could be on the same page when we got together to talk about the film. Great. And then in terms of uh, actors, I know you'd said previously mm -hmm. that there's so many great ones, but you wanted ones that you knew could carry the emotionality of so many of the scenes. Can you talk about what you were looking for specifically in terms of that emotion? Um, well, first and foremost, I needed people to connect to the story in a way um, that I felt would honor the film. I mean, it's just, it's such an emotional film that no one can dial it in. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, you might be presented with A-listers, but if they're not totally passionate about it, I don't want them. Do you know what I mean? So they had to be very passionate about the story. Um, each character had a different need. Um, so for instance, uh, what I loved about Nicole Kidman, for example, is that um, there's kind of a, a strength in Nicole Kidman that I saw in Sue. So there's a lot of similarities I could start to see emotionally. So I don't know, a lot of things started to become quite apparent to me when I was dreaming the characters and meeting the actors. It, it, it became quite obvious who was right. What, what is it about um, uh, the passion in an actor? What, how, do you, how can you tell? Are there, are there phrases? Is there body language? Just even when you know that they can nail the performance, but in terms of really being committed like that. They always care you? about it. Mm -hmm. They can talk about it from their own point of view, they can own it, they can have an opinion, they, they're deep in the material. So that's really important. Um, you know, when I, when I met Nicole in New York to talk about the role, she just spoke about it in such a deep way and how it related to her life and imagine that and we just had this such a deep conversation. So that's a place you're starting from. 
I mean, course of performances are going to be amazing, you know, because we're going to go to such deep and honest places together. Um, so, yeah, it's really important, I think. First day of shooting, where was this? <laughs> the first week were night shoots with Sonny, five-year-old Sonny, in the train station. Wow, okay. So that woke wow. me up. And I understand that Sonny, this is one of his first, this was one of his first acting roles at that time. Well, yeah, he's, yeah. Unbelievable. He's just five. Oh yep. my gosh. Yep. And so you saw how many children to find this uh, amazing thousands. boy? Uh, we cast about four to five months um, in three, com three cities in India. Um, and then we would look at that, we'd look at those tapes coming in uh, on Dropbox every week. And then we'd, we created a short list of maybe 100 to 200 children. And then a group of us went over to India and did these acting workshops for, for about a week or two weeks, um, just trying to find our kids. Right. So then, uh, so you start with the um, night shoots at the train station. And uh, how was that, especially because uh, Sonny's so young and uh, yeah. this is one of his, I mean, it must have been overwhelming for him, this huge crew, or I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, we're all just learning the language and learning how we all work together. So, you know, you just stumble through it. And the minute you get it, like maybe you just find a moment that's really special. Um, you just know that you're on the right path and you just build upon those experiences and the confidence and the, t you know, the way you move together as a crew becomes easier. And so very quickly you just tune into what the film's going to be. Um, but, you know, up until that point you're always imagining how it could be and um, that's all hypothetical until you're literally making the thing. Um, so the reality of working with a child, working in India, all that comes to a head at that moment and so it's uh, kind of terrifying and exciting at the same time. We were asking Greg how it was to uh, be there with this camera and he said that actually most of the people around were used to uh, productions being around there. Can you talk about maybe using some of the people that were maybe not extras, they were actual townspeople? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, I think Calcutta was easier to shoot in than, say, Mumbai um, because they're just not, I mean, they're not, they're not as exposed to movies as people in Mumbai. Um, so, you know, they, be, they get curious, but a lot of the times people, they've got to catch the train, they've got to move on. So every 20 minutes you'd get a new wave of people. So if someone started to look, there's a certain point they've got to go and catch the train. So I don't know, it kind of worked for us. Um, we would, uh, you know, we would definitely have extras there that we would put into the foreground and then have live crowds in the background, like the ticket box scene. Um, we were, when, when he's being um, uh, kind of you know, ignored and shoved out of the way when he's trying to ask for help. Um, we we controlled the first three or four ticket boxes and then the rest down the end was just real tickets being sold. So, because um, we're working in live locations, so we, we kind of got the scale that way, um, just working very cleverly within, the, within real spaces. Now, are you shooting uh, a lot of it uh, sort of in chronological order in terms of his life? I mean... Pretty much, I mean, we, we, we shot India first and then we shot Australia second. Um, it was almost chronological. Um, we shot in Calcutta, all the stuff in Calcutta first, and then we moved out to the villages. So it wasn't, wasn't that linear. Um, but, uh, I mean, Dev Patel's first scene was when he met his mother at the end of the movie. Oh, wow, okay. So there was very non-linear moments. But I think by shooting India first, we were able to learn a lot from that and take take uh, the textures and the colours and the, and the visual language that we created there into the contemporary story. Um, so I think it was great shooting India first. Garth, taking just a little bit of a detour in terms of the questions, um, for you, what were some mistakes uh, in your career early on that you made that you make sure that you don't replicate in terms of whether it's just working with a large crew in an outdoor location? Things that maybe in the beginning you weren't sure of and now having had so many productions under your belt, you're more aware of. Uh, you do absolutely learn from your mistakes. Um, a lot of them are directorial mistakes. Some of them are production mistakes. Um, but the number one rule I have is always trust your instinct. Your instinct is never wrong. So if you have a bad feeling about someone you're about to employ or cast or a location or a scene that's not right, it, it, there is a problem. And to acknowledge that and talk about it, that, that's definitely one of the things that I um, live by. The other thing is you just have to be very prepared and never assume anything. Like, so always see the set before you shoot it. 
always see the wardrobe before you see it on the actors on the day. Like never assume anything is gonna be okay on the day. It's just the number one rule that I have. So I'm, I'm always making sure I see everything before we shoot. Um, and if you, I'm well prepared and have a good dialogue with everybody around me and you follow those rules and generally you should be okay. <laughs> so when someone throws the, uh, the don't worry line, it'll be fine, which I, I know someone who works from their intuition gets as well. <laughs> what do you say to that? I've, I've done it a few times and it has been okay, but I've also done that and it's been terrible. So you just go by that rule no matter what? Yep. Uh -huh. Even idea. when I'm absolutely exhausted, like in the last movie, um, we just finished shooting and we were traveling to a new location and um, we could go and visit the set, but it was like another hour and a half diversion. And I was exhausted, I just wanted to go to bed and I said, just gotta check it out. Um, so it's just one of those rules that I have. Just gotta see it before you shoot it. What was the largest crew you were working with and what location was that? Uh, In terms of lion. Yeah. Um, for, uh, the largest crew, I mean, probably, I mean, probably the one of the biggest things we did in India was closing down the Howrah Bridge. So that's never been done before. Um, and it's the sequence where little Saru escapes from the child snatchers and he runs out of the train station and emerges onto the bridge and is kind of overcome by the scale of the bridge. He's never seen anything like that before. And he's almost too afraid to cross it because of the scale of it. And he then goes to the side and sees the Bubba Shrine. So that bridge, we had to get permission to control that. So we had obviously had to have a lot of traffic management at either end of the bridge. Um, uh, so that was probably the biggest logistical scene that we did. Um, and then there were other times we were shooting something quite small, but we had thousands of people looking at us and that kind of consumed a lot of resources, just trying to control the crowd um, as well. But it was a fairly simple shoot. Like we didn't use any lighting, very small amounts of lighting. Um, we shot with two cameras. I mean, it's all it's pretty basic stuff. How did you deal with sound? It's a good question. Um, Nikul, our sound recordist in India, I think was a bit of a genius. Um, he may have even been nominated for an Oscar, I think, at some point. But he was just a wonderful sound recordist. And you'll even notice the actors, when they're in a scene, if they hear a train horn, they'll just pause and then they'll continue the line after the train. So, like, everyone's very aware of sound, but you couldn't hide from it. We had to do a lot of clean up, but the sound recorders was very good. It was extremely good. So when you're on set for Lion, are you mostly working with the crew or are you mostly working with the actors? Where's your attention mostly focused? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of everything. Um, the minute I arrive on set, you say good morning everyone, and I, the first place I go is a, the wardrobe truck. So the makeup truck. So I meet my actors in the morning and say good morning and make sure that they're comfortable with the day ahead of them and it's the first thing I do is say good morning to everybody and then often the first hour of the morning you're with the crew because the actors are still preparing so you're you know, I, and then I sit with my DP for, and we have 10 minutes together um, and I talk about and the AD and we just talk about the morning's work and what we're trying to achieve and then we walk to set and then we then we all go off independently and work with our crew mm. so um, there's definitely a rhythm that I have um, when I'm working um, that seems to have worked for me. In terms of Google Earth, how familiar were you with it? I mean, I know it's been around, what, a decade, I guess, uh, before actually delving into the shots and figuring out the older version of it? Yeah, so Google Earth, I mean, I use all the time for location searching anyway in commercials. And so Google Earth is a, a tool that I use as much as I do with Microsoft Word. Um, but, you know, I think what was, I mean, it's, it's a risk having anything computerized in your movie. I mean, there's nothing more boring than looking at a mobile phone or a computer screen in a film. But um, I think in this instance, it was kind of really exciting to, to take the power of his past and his yearning and his, um, you know, all of that into these computer, into these computer images, you know, of, you know, into Google Earth and to see these maps passing through. So it suddenly became very loaded and interesting and haunting. Um, and the fact that it was low resolution and um, the, it didn't work very fast, the kind of the texture of it for me was like memory. And um, so suddenly, suddenly I got quite excited about the software and how it became this strange um, window into his past. 
So it was, it was a great challenge to kind of bring that software to life in a way that was meaningful. Now, did you actually go to the Google headquarters in Mountain View? No, no, no. Oh, we no, mm -hmm. just no. All we did really is we we had to get their approval, obviously, because we were showing their software in a film, and they were fine with that. And then we um, asked them to help us, you know, get the software back to that period. Um, so that was and and return and figure out a way how do we get the old maps back as well, because everything is so updated now, so high resolution um, that we had to kind of yeah detech it, go backwards. When you're making a film about someone's life and you've met this person, you've met their family, you've traveled to their homeland, how much pressure, responsibility do you feel? Huge amounts. Yeah, I did a documentary once um, in my early years and um, really felt that responsibility in a visceral way. And um, I mean, you know, it's something I'm very conscious of. And um, so, you know, that's why I really did have to spend a lot of time. Um, and I think I said to Sue, look, maybe we're not going to get the story perfectly right like a documentary you know because you just can't you know it's kind of a compressed version of it but i hope that i get it emotionally right for you and i hope that you feel proud about the message that comes out of it out of out of your story because um, that's that's really what i was hoping to get out of it so it kind of simplifies what you're trying to represent for them um so yeah that, that's yeah but it's a huge responsibility at the end of the day which scene of lion are you most proud of Oh. So many beautiful scenes, and it's uh, such a journey. But look, I, I do love the scene with Sue and Saru, just the two-hander, um, where she talks about the vision of the ghost and how she could have had children. I just thought that was um, when I was filming that, I was unaware of where I was. I was so like I was lost in her performance. So um, that's pretty exciting when that happens.